Hey everybody, I'm April Dunford. Thanks so much for choosing to come to my session today. Um, what I want to talk about is positioning and specifically I want to talk about positioning because I think it is one of the most powerful and yet tragically misunderstood tools for growth, particularly for a SaaS startup. What I'm going to teach you today is how positioning impacts the way customers perceive your product. I'm going to talk about what you can do to optimize your positioning. And then lastly, I'm going to give you some tips about common mistakes to avoid. So if you're ready, let's go. Now, we talk about the fact that markets are crowded. In fact, we say it so much that it's almost like a cliche. Markets are crowded. But I don't think we really understand just how bad this is. So let me give you an example just to freak you out about markets a little bit. Um, if you're in marketing, this is Scott Brinkler's marketing technology landscape. I like to use this to show how crowded markets actually are. Um, if you look at this, this is Scott's attempt to model just one tiny corner of the software universe, just the solutions for marketing people. And look at that thing. There's 350 companies on there. How are you supposed to stand out? How are customers supposed to make sense out of this when there are so many other options to choose from? In fact, the first time I came across this slide was in 2012 with 350 companies on it. And I thought, you know what? This can't possibly stay like this. Customers can't figure it out. I bet there's going to be some consolidation over the years. And so I went looking for the 2018 version of this chart recently and whoo, was I wrong? I was so wrong. Now we've got 7,000 products on that chart. That means in five years, 6,650 new products have come into this market. And again, this is one slice of the overall big market. In order to help customers understand what we do, we need to stand out from all of this stuff. We need to make sure that customers intuitively understand what we do and why they should care because our solution is simply one choice in an ocean of choices. Now, if you look at the research on this, customers, when they encounter something new, they use what they know to make sense out of what they don't. So do you understand that? They use what they already understand to try and figure out the things they haven't yet figured out. And to do that, they kind of use two big frames. So the first one is market categories. The second one is trends. So market categories help customers answer the question, what is this thing? Why should I care? Trends help us answer the question, why now? Why is this important to me today? Let's start with market categories. So customers use market categories to, to basically frame a context around what something is. If we go back to Scott's chart, you can see that he's attempted to categorize these solutions by color coding them. So the red things are advertising and promotion, the orange things are content and experience, etc. So let's say I'm looking for a solution in a particular category. I might say, hey, I'm interested in live chat or I'm interested in account-based marketing. I would narrow it down to social and relationships and then I would say, hey, I'm looking for a live chat solution. Let's just look in the live chat box. This is good. I've now narrowed it down from 7,000 solutions to, I don't know, a couple of dozen there. So that's great. But that's not all that market categories do. So it helps us narrow the choices down. But when we declare that our product exists in a certain market category, it actually triggers a bunch of really powerful assumptions that helps tell customers what it is that you are all about. It works a bit like this. If I declare I'm in a certain market, you will automatically think, oh, you're in this particular market, you're an email solution. Who's your competitor? It must be Gmail. What's the price? Well, it should be free or very low cost. What are the features? It probably has an inbox. It probably has a calendar. Who are my target customers? Well, anybody who needs an, in, who needs an email solution. Interestingly, even though this is really super important, we almost never position products 
deliberately. In fact, we almost always use a sort of default positioning and that default positioning can often get us into a lot of trouble. I'll give you an example. Early in my career, I worked at a company and what we sold was an enterprise CRM. Uh, at the time, this was when Salesforce was still pretty small. At the time, the biggest competitor in this space was a company called Siebel. They were 8,000 employees, 2 billion revenue. We were a tiny little startup with 30 employees and 2 million revenue. Um, but we were gonna take them on. And so we said, we're an enterprise CRM. So if you're bigger than a certain number of users, you would come and use our CRM. The problem was we would go into customers and we would say, hi, what we have is an enterprise CRM. And it would trigger all of these assumptions. The customer would say, well, okay, your competitor must be Siebel. How are you better than Siebel? Uh, they would expect us to be priced at around the same level as Siebel. They expect us to have the same features as Siebel. The problem was none of those assumptions were really true. If you compared us to Siebel, we were much less mature. Um, we didn't have nearly the features that Siebel had. And in fact, in a direct comparison, us versus Siebel, they were the leader in enterprise CRM. And what we were was kind of a crappy, not so functional CRM. Now, we, we did win the occasional deal just by discounting. Um, so if you wanted kind of a cheap, crappy CRM, you could maybe choose us. Needless to say, this wasn't a great strategy. Um, we did have a couple of key features going for us. And one of our critical key features we had was um, a, an ability to model relationships in a different way than Siebel did. The problem is nobody really understood why that was special. We keep showing it to customers and they were kind of like, hmm, huh, we're not actually all that interested in that feature. We had a bit of a breakthrough, however, when uh, we managed to get a meeting with uh, the head of investment banking at a very big investment bank. I tagged along with the salesperson on this call. We go to this meeting and we showed them this special feature that we showed everybody else. And this head of investment banking got super excited. He said, he started asking us all, those, all these questions. Well, does that mean you can model things in this way? And we said, yes, we could. And he said, well, does that mean I could show if two people had sat on a board together or people that used to work together, not at the same company. And we said, yeah, you can model that. He said, that's fantastic. Hang on. He ran down the hall and he got his two vice presidents and he brought them back and he said, hey, show them that thing. And so we showed them our special feature and they got so excited and everybody got super excited. The guys are in the room all jumping up and down and, and we closed the deal really quickly. And we said to ourselves, hey, Maybe investment bankers really like our stuff. So we went and we showed it to a bunch of other investment bankers and every single meeting went the same way. We showed them the thing, everybody got really excited, we closed the deal. So eventually we went back and we asked ourselves, maybe, maybe we're not enterprise CRM. Maybe we're something else. Maybe we're CRM for investment banks. Now in the surface of it, that might not sound like a big shift to you, but it actually was a giant shift. Um, and at the beginning, it felt like a very brave, difficult decision to make. Our investors weren't super happy with this. They were like, wait, the, the enterprise CRM market is massive and now you're just gonna sell to investment banks? How are you ever gonna make any money just selling to that? Um, but the way we looked at it is we said, look, nobody really wants our stuff. Investment banks are really excited when we show it to them. Let's sell to investment banks now when we've sold to a whole bunch of investment banks. Then we'll start looking at insurance companies or private client services or retail banks, things that are adjacent. So we made the shift. And this shift was transformational for us. So first of all, in terms of competitive comparisons, we now got to walk in and say, hey, we're CRM for investment banks. And people would say, well, hang on. Do you actually compete with Siebel? And we'd say, Siebel, we love those guys. They're fantastic. If you're a call center in India or a manufacturing plant or a retailer, but not you, captain of the universe, Wolf of Wall Street, you're special. You need some special stuff. We'd show them our special thing and everybody would get excited. And they wouldn't even really take Siebel as a direct competitor. This was great. 
the the impact on the expectation around pricing was neat too. When we were competing directly against Siebel, they were the benchmark for pricing. Uh, because we didn't have as many features as them, we were always having to discount. But now that we're CRM for investment banks, there was actually an expectation that we would be more expensive than Siebel. So we ended up putting the price way up. Um, the feature expectations were different too. So now it was kind of accepted that we weren't going to do everything Siebel did. And we had some extra special banker stuff that got the bankers really excited. Um, and then it was clear who we were for. We could really, really narrow down our marketing and sales targets just on investment banks. What happened throughout this transformation is um, before we were doing about 2 million revenue, we got as far as 70 million revenue in the next 18 months. And in fact, Siebel got so frustrated with us beating them uh, all up and down Wall Street in every single investment and banking account, uh, they eventually acquired us for $1.7 billion. So it, it, we were worried that maybe the market wasn't big enough and we couldn't make any money. Uh, in fact, the exact opposite was true. So if positioning is so important, and we know that we need to do it deliberately, how do we actually choose the best position for our product? Well, the first thing is your positioning needs to advantage your unique strengths. You can think about it this way. If you look at all the features and functionality or the capabilities of your product, you can look at them as like each of these emojis on this graph. And most of those things are just kind of uh, meh. They're sort of table stakes. Everybody does that stuff. But if you go talk to your best customers, the people that love you, the people that recommend you, uh, the people that would die if you took your product away from them, and you said, what do we do that's really amazing? They will highlight a subset of features that are really your special sauce. These are the fire features that you've got. Those are your true differentiators. These are the things that make you special for the customers that love you the most. And then you can think about markets that overlay those features. So you could look at a market and say, well, you know, we could position ourselves in one particular market or another particular market. But what you actually want to do is draw a circle around the market that contains your key differentiating features. So your best category puts the strengths of your product right in the center. So an example of this was I got a call from some guys that were doing, uh, they told me what they did was email for lawyers. And the, when we got talking, I asked them to show me their calendar functionality and they told me they didn't have one. And I was laughing and I was like, well, how could you be email without calendar? You know what you call it, email without a calendar? You call it crappy email, that's what you call it. Nobody's ever heard of email without a calendar. But interestingly, they had all kinds of customers that loved what they were doing. And I said, well, look, when you talk to those guys, what do they love the most about you? And what they heard was um, they had a special feature. The special feature was they could do this kind of context aware, super secure file sharing. Now, you could position this thing as email. Let's call that market one. You could position it as chat, maybe. Let's call that market two or I could position it as team collaboration. If I position it as team collaboration, this context aware file sharing, secure file sharing thing is right in the middle of team collaboration. I don't expect email to even do that. Uh, and does anybody care about a calendar? No, they don't. So what you need to do is find a market where your strengths are right at the center. Here's another example. Um, this is a company, uh, in Kitchener Waterloo and what they do is they make robots the original founders of the company were schooled in robotics they made robots eventually they got an idea to make a robot for a manufacturing plant what this robot does is it delivers things from one thing to the other now if you don't know much about robots you might think that that doesn't sound like a difficult problem to solve but it turns out it's very difficult it requires mapping sensors artificial intelligence this is a very sophisticated machine but when they got out selling it what they found out was they'd go into a manufacturing plant and they'd talk to the person that buys robots and they say look uh, we we've got this amazing new robot 
And instantly, this would trigger a, bit, a bunch of assumptions in the minds of those customers. Manufacturers have been buying robots for decades. And when you say robot, most of them are thinking about the, the thing you see on this slide here on the left. It, it's, it doesn't move around. It doesn't have mapping or sensors. It is not a marvel of artificial intelligence. It's picking up a bloody plastic bucket and putting it in a box. Eventually, they decided, you know what, maybe this robot category isn't doing us any favors. So they took a big step back and they said, what are our special features? What have we got? Movement, mapping, sensors, artificial intelligence. What market would make all of that obvious to our customers and help us prove that we're special just obviously? And eventually what they came up with was, you know what, what we really are is a self-driving car. We're a self-driving car for a manufacturing plant. In fact, they call themselves autonomous vehicles for industrial uses. But when you think about it in that context, when they went in to talk to customers, they'd say, we're a self-driving car for manufacturing. Of course it drives around. Of course it has artificial intelligence. Of course it doesn't compete with this thing on the left. Your expectations around all of it would change. So that's market categories. I wanna to touch on trends. So market categories describe what this is and why should I care. Trends are something we can leverage that help customers understand why is this important now. We do a terrible job in tech of differentiating between market categories and trends. We confuse the two things completely. I like to think about it this way. Um, do you know there's this company, Pantone, they're like the color people. And every year they come out with a press release and they, talk, they, they declare a color of the year by looking at data and stuff. I have no idea how they come up with this, but they say, you know, 2018, the color of the year is ultraviolet or it's purple for you normal people. So it's ultraviolet. And then the next thing you know, I got purple lipstick, purple shirts, purple couches, purple side tables. This is an example. If you are making a purple couch, you're still in the couch business. Purple is a trend. That trend can be applied to your product to make it seem more hip and now and interesting and current. We do a terrible job of differentiating these in tech. If we think about market categories in tech, market categories are categories of things that you buy, a CRM, a database, group chat, networking software. These are market categories. Trends are things that apply to those markets. So artificial intelligence is a trend. I can apply it to CRM or databases or networks or security. Same thing goes for blockchain, machine learning. These are things that I can apply to markets. Trends are important because we can't keep writing the same articles and the same books and then can't keep doing the same talks about CRM over and over and over again. People want to know what's new and interesting and what's changing. So a lot of the media is really focused on these trends and new things that are helping to shift our understanding of these things. And so uh, buyers will see this across the market and they'll want to learn more about it. They also get worried that they're going to get left behind. So these new trends might actually impact the way they're doing business. And so they want to make sure that they're keeping up on this stuff. So fundamentally, a trend itself doesn't define a market and it can't redefine a market even, but it can make your market super, super interesting. Now here's where it matters for us. You have a particular solution you need to declare that that solution exists in a market category. Otherwise, we don't know what you are. But if I can overlay a trend on top of that, not only is it easy to understand what you are and why people should care, but there's some urgency around it and you understand why you should care about that right now. If you can get right in the middle of those three things, that's when you got the spicy stuff happening in there. Now, can you mess this up? Yes, you can mess it up in lots of ways, in fact. <laughs> and so let me talk about where you miss the mark and you're not quite in the middle, you're kind of off to one edge. If you're gonna be anywhere, you wanna be here. If you declare you got a solution and you declare it's, a, it's in a certain market context, people are gonna understand what you're all about. If you don't try to associate with that, that with some trends, 
that's okay. That is kind of relevant. Uh, it might be a little boring. Maybe it's a little sleepy. You might have a hard time getting PR for this stuff. You might not get as many inbound leads as you hope you should, but uh, it, it, you can make a very nice business here. And in fact, most of my career, I've been selling things like databases and middleware and things that are just horribly untrendy, but you can still make a lot of money here. If you can put a trend in there and spice it up, it's better. But if you don't, this is an okay place to be. Now, where you're going to get into trouble is if you go into one of these other two interstitials. The first one is here where you've defined the solution. You're talking about some trends, um, but you neglected to tell me what market you're in. Therefore, I have no idea what you are. So you might sound kind of cool, but baffling. So I'll give you an example of this. I got this call from these guys in Silicon Valley, and then they had just raised an abnormal amount of money. Uh, and they said, hey, we think we have a positioning problem. Nobody can understand what we do. And I said, cool, let me uh, get, lay it on me. Like, tell me, what is it that you do? And they said, well, what we do is we're the sharing economy for cats. Really? Yeah, we're the sharing economy for pets overall. And I said, what? That doesn't make any sense. Like, what do you mean? Like, are people sharing the pets? Like, that? Like people are, like, it's like a timeshare on pets. And they're like, no, 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 no. They got really frustrated with me. And they were mad that I wasn't excited about this. And they had raised so much money. But I just couldn't figure it out. Um, and, and eventually, the guy on the phone got really frustrated with me because I was so stupid. And he said, April, listen, you don't understand this. What we are is like Uber for cats. And my first thought was, Uber for cats? Sign me up, man. I want to send the little cats. I want the little cats to come to my house with their little paws on the little steering wheel. And I want them to drive right up and drive me around town. Uber for cats. So, like, I'm on the phone. I'm dying laughing. I'm like, really? The geniuses of Silicon Valley have taught the cats how to drive. And then the guy was really mad at me. He was like, no, that's not what it is, dummy. We're actually, and it turns out what they were is a two-sided marketplace for, like, pet services, you want a groomer or something to come to your house, you can order it up on your phone. Uh, but anyways, my point is Uber for cats, like Uber is not a market. The sharing economy is not a market. You got to tell me what you do. You can't just talk about the trend. Uh, you have to give me a market context. So don't make this mistake. The second interstitial is the one over on the right hand side here where I got market context, you're talking about the market, you're talking about the trends, you just neglect to associate those with your actual product. <laughs> this happens sometimes when we get a little carried away talking about the trends because that's what the media want to talk, wants to talk about and you know sometimes investors get overly excited about these things. My favorite example of this is um, Long Island iced tea. You might have heard this story, but last year, Long Island iced tea, they were, uh, they're publicly listed on the NASDAQ exchange and their stock price had been gradually going down over the last few years. The business was not doing so good. And the NASDAQ threatened to delist them because their uh, market cap was too low to stay publicly listed on the exchange. So this was becoming an emergency. And so they needed to do something fast to get the stock price up. And so apparently what they decided was they were going to do a rebrand. And the, the rebrand of this was they were no longer going to be Long Island iced tea. Uh, they were going to rebrand themselves as Long Blockchain. And they put out a press release and said, hey, we were changing our ticker symbol and everything. And we're Long Blockchain. And we're going to do like blockchain stuff. The problem was there was actually no other details beyond that. There were no partnerships. There was no explanation of were they using blockchain technology? Were they doing anything with blockchain? Uh, how did this actually relate to the iced tea business at all? There were no answers for these questions. Now, when I first saw this press release come out, I was like, you know what? God love them, but there's no way this thing is going to work. Like this is just going to be a disaster. And in fact, um, this stock went up by 400%. 
and it, this made me feel bad. And in fact, I was a bit worried that maybe reality had shifted and you could in fact get away with this. <laughs> and, um, but what happened eventually was after a couple weeks of stock analysts going in and asking them questions and saying, look, we need to know where the blockchain thing is. Everybody eventually came to their senses and realized there was no there there. Um, and the, the, the stock took a beating. So all the new people that bought it because they thought there was some blockchain, they sold because obviously there wasn't any blockchain. And then all the people that had bought them previously because they thought the iced tea business was pretty good, they sold too because they thought these guys had completely lost the plot. Um, the stock fell off a cliff and they got delisted and I felt better about life, but uh, it didn't go so good for long blockchain. Anyways, the moral of that story is you, you can't just talk about trends and a market. You got to actually have this stuff make some sense. It just can't be complete below me. What you want to be is right in the middle. So I'll leave you with one example where I think they've done a very great job of doing this. Um, so Redgate Software, I've done a little work with these guys. They're like one of my favorite companies. Um, they've been around for a long time. I don't, I'm not sure you would even categorize them as a startup anymore. Um, and they're in kind of a sleepy market is database tools. Um, and, uh, you know, they're a great example of a company that's made a very, very good business out of something that's a little bit sleepy. So um, over the course of of Redgate's existence, they now have 800,000 active users, 800,000. So they, they're an amazing company, they've been doing great. Um, but they, uh, they have a really wide portfolio of tools. And one of the things they noticed was that frequently customers would buy one or two of the tools and wouldn't even realize that all the other tools that they could get from Redgate even existed. Um, the second thing was that they wanted to be more relevant and and trendy with the things that their customers were worried about at a particular time so they noticed that sometimes their sales reps would call in and they'd say you know what this stuff just isn't a priority for us this year we're worried about other things and so they took a big step back and they they wanted to see how could we we have a context around the stuff that redgate does to make it a little bit hip and cool and relevant to the things that people believe are a high priority right now. And eventually one of the things they noticed was that their customers who are for the large part uh, software development teams um, were in the middle of doing a DevOps transformation. So this is kind of a new way of thinking about developing code and operations around that. And a lot of projects were going on around this DevOps transformation. Interestingly, when Redgate looked at that, they noticed that one of the gaps there is what happens in a DevOps transformation with data? And, and they have an amazing solution to help with that. And so they created a story around database DevOps, which is how you handle database in a DevOps transformation that gave them two things. One, it made their software very, very relevant to a top of mind issue that their customers were dealing with. And secondly, it gave them a great story to talk about the Rengate offerings across the board and not just point products in their portfolio. The result was two things. One, um, their sales reps did a much better job of selling multiple products into each individual account they sold into because they had a reason to buy more than one product together. Um, the second thing was that their inbound leads went up by over 100%. Um, so again, I think they're a great example of where you really get the three things coming together. Uh, that's it. I want to leave you with uh, a couple of things. So one, uh, you need to think about market categories. You need to do that in a deliberate way. Uh, secondly, you need to think about trends. It's okay if you're not trendy, as long as you get the market category stuff right. Uh, but if you can figure out a way to bring a trend in it that's relevant and fits with your products and your market, then there's really some magic you can unlock there. Uh, the concepts that I'm describing in this talk, I'm actually writing a book about this called Obviously Awesome. It's coming out in a few months. 
um, and you can sign up for updates on that. If you want to know when it's coming up, you can sign up at positioningbook.com. If you have feedback on this or you want to talk to me or whatever, I'm on Twitter at April Dunford. You can maybe tweet me something about this exact session and I would appreciate that a lot. Um, thank you for joining me today. I really had fun. I hope you had fun uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.